Hi, I am Ms. Sloan, and this is a video for AP Biology. This is about speciation and macro evolution. So I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller here and present to you. I want to remind you that in the descriptor of this video down below, there are two column notes. Column one is scaffolding of the notes, and I'll help you fill those in. And column two, I encourage you to put in pictures. So for us right now, this is chapter 17. I want to remind you that you always want to go back to the College Board and look at the topics and the expectations. So this topic right here is in Unit 7, 7.10, Speciation. And if you look at their unit, and this is a hyperdoc to a unit guide that I have made for my students that has helpful reviews on it, feel free to use it yourself. But if you look at 7.10, here are the expectations of what you should know as a result of species, or uh, after discussing speciation. All right, so we'll define what a species is, and then we'll talk about the reproductive isolating mechanisms. What can cause two uh, species to become two species, one species to become two, what can isolate them, and then maintain that isolation. And then in my second video, I'll talk to you about modes of speciation and principles in macroevolution. All right, so first of all, let's differentiate between micro and macro evolution. So on your notes, um, this would be 17.1. Microevolution is a change in allele frequencies. And remember, we measured a change in allele frequencies. Uh, we looked at Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, P and Q, to remember that. And anytime those allele frequencies change, we say evolution is occurring. If it's still the same species, it's microevolution. If enough changes occur, this can lead to macro macroevolution, is where you have a whole new species. So microevolution is a change in allele frequencies, and macroevolution is the origin of a new species, and it results from the accumulation of microevolutionary change over time. And this is what Darwin was trying to figure out, right? And like I said, this is just going to be a snapshot of it. The first thing we need to know is at what point, right, if we look back even here, okay, at what point do you have a uh, you know, a new species. Was it here? Was it here? Where exactly did you have a new species? So we need to define that. All right. So when you look at this, and I know this is a simplification, but what is most important to look at? That it has two eyes or one eyes? You know, where the teeth are, where the eyes are, how many tentacles it are, there are. There are currently over 24 different species concepts trying to take care of all the different organisms on our planet. Now, um, the morphological species concept is probably the oldest. This is based on structures. This is really good for uh, if you're a paleontologist, if you're looking at fossils, right? Because you can't look necessarily at their DNA, uh, protein sequences, behavior, mating calls they make. You can't analyze any of that. All you have is anatomy. So that's the morphological and oldest one, morphological species concept. And so that one under 2A, species are distinguished from each other by distinct physical characteristics. <laughs> I'm going to try that one more time. Distinct physical characteristics. All right. Then let's look at the evolutionary species concept. So members of the species share an evolutionary pathway. So that, that's what you're looking for there, this evolutionary pathway. And if you're not on the same path, then you're not the same species. Um, so evolutionary pathway. The phylogenetic species concept, we'll be talking more about this. I've already introduced you to cladograms, but we'll talk more about this. And what's great about this is you can, you can use anatomy, absolutely, and you will use phylogeny, but you're making comparisons usually between DNA sequences and amino acid sequences in proteins. So it's the smallest set of interbreeding organisms, usually a population, that share a common ancestor ancestor, this would be a common ancestor right here, okay? And a monophyletic branch, it's a branch of a phylogenetic tree that contains all the descendants of a common ancestor. Again, more on that on cladograms. And the advantage is it does not rely on morphological traits. It looks at DNA. It looks at DNA. So the biological species concept, what you're going to see again and again on this one is it's a group who um, whose members will interbreed, 
an interbreed in nature, right? In the wild, not in a zoo, okay? But in the wild and they produce fertile offspring. And when you look here, it says gene flow between populations hold the, holds the phenotype of a population together. So if there's gene flow, then you are one species. This is the definition from the College Board. A biological species concept provides a commonly used definition for sexually reproducing organisms, and they're capable of interbreeding and exchanging genetic information to produce viable fertile offspring. Okay. Now, this works for a lot of members of the animal kingdom, not so much for bacteria, some protists, fungi, and plants, right? Because if you are, if you do not reproduce sexually all the time, then it's hard to use that definition, right? It's hard to use that definition. So underneath the biological species concept, relies primarily on reproductive isolation to identify different species and lack of gene flow, lack of gene flow. And I gave you reproductive isolation is defined as physiological, behavioral, and genetic processes that inhibit in, um, interbreeding. We'll be talking about the main reproductive isolating mechanisms in just a minute. Okay, disadvantages to this, it cannot always be tested in nature and it cannot be applied to asexual organisms, asexual organisms. So here are just a few of the different species uh, definitions. I wanted to show you a few of those. And just remember, we've settled on that you are, you interbreed, you share a gene pool. And now we look at DNA comparisons, we look at proteins, because, just because it looks similar, just because they're in the same habitat, um, doesn't mean that they are the same species. All right, so let's take a look at some of those reproductive isolating mechanisms. So those will be um, broken down into two categories, prezygotic, trying to move myself here, prezygotic, so all the way up to um, just before forming a zygote, right, prezygotic, and then postzygote is starting from the zygote. So these are all different isolating mechanisms. Remember any structural, functional, or behavioral characteristic that prevents successful reproduction from occurring. So we're gonna start, okay, look at this very first one, habitat isolation. Species at the same location occupy different habitats. Now, oh, so these are all the prezygotic isolating mechanisms. Sorry, I forgot about this, this slide. So the sperm is not gonna meet the egg here. All right, so habitat isolation. You might live in this similar habitat, but you're isolated because somebody lives at the top of the canopy and somebody's living at the bottom of the canopy of the trees, or somebody is on the trunk of the tree and one is in the grass below it. So you're living near each other. Possibly you could interbreed, but because you live in different areas of that habitat, that's what keeps you separate. So even you're even within the same geographical range, that's the word you need, but you're still isolated, okay? So now let's level up. We are now living in the same location. What's keeping us separate, right? We're all living on the edge of this pond. We're frogs. Well, temporal isolation. We may not want to mate at the same time. We have different types of, different times of the year when mating is going to happen or different locations where mating happens, one on the edge of the water, one out in the middle of the water, one up on a rock, right? These are all things that can separate us from within our habitat, okay? So temporal isolation, different times or different locations within that habitat, okay? So the first one, we're in the same geographic area, but we're separated within our habitat. Second one is we're living right next to each other, but we don't want to have sex at the same location or the same time. The third one is this, we are in the same habitat, we are ready to have sex at the same time, but we don't know each other's uh, dances, each other's moves, songs and calls to indicate that you're ready to reproduce. So this is behavioral isolation. Could have to do with pheromones, dances or calls, okay? Now, we're gonna get closer. We're in the same habitat, the same location, same time, and we know each other's dance moves but now our parts don't fit together. So this is mechanical isolation. The male dragonfly, his clasper to hold the female, um, only works on his species. So even if they know, I'm ready, even if the pheromones say yes, their parts don't fit together. So inaccessibility. 
All right, so now let's say our parts even fit together. That is gamete isolation. So on the egg, the egg might, you might not have uh, the right structure on the sperm to bind with the receptor on the egg so you can never form the zygote. So you're there, you've done everything. You're in the same habitat location at the same time and uh, same location is good for you. You know each other's dance moves, your parts fit together, but lo and behold, the sperm and the egg cannot join. So that is gametic isolation. Gametes may not fuse to form a zygote, all right? Well, what if those two parts can come together? What if the sperm and the egg can join? Then this would be post-zygotic. And it has to do with one of two things. Either the zygote does not develop normally, so it dies early, or the offspring, uh, either the first generation, the F1 are sterile or the F2 are sterile. So this is after the formation of the zygote, hybrid inviability. So for instance, these two cats, um, if they mate, um, their offspring, they know they live in the same habitat, know the dances, have the hormones, parts fit together, sperm and egg meet, but their, their zygote will not develop. And then the classic one for infertility is the, uh, uh, sorry, donkey and the horse. When they mate and you have a mule, the mule is sterile. Um, this would be the F1. Now, sometimes mules do can reproduce actually there are exceptions to that but the f2 um, does not develop or cannot reproduce by the time you get to the f2 they can't so hybrid inviability zygote cannot develop properly and hybrid sterility um, sometimes they can mate but the f2 hybrids have reduced fitness okay and then this i just wanted to expose you to some other terms or phrases in case it's done a little bit differently. So let's take a look at this graph. So this one is saying prezygotic isolating mechanism. So they have differentiated geographic and ecological isolation. So these are species occur in different areas which are often separated by a physical barrier. So you're not even in the same habitat, okay? So that would be even larger. So I started with habitat, but this is saying you're in that mountain range, I'm in that mountain range, so we never have even the opportunity to even see each other or have issues, right? We're just miles away from each other. Ecological isolation, you are in the same habitat, but slightly different, right? Those micro habitats where you're at the top of the canopy, they're at the bottom. Remember temporal isolation, you want to mate in different seasons, different times of the day or a different place on the rock as opposed to the water, temporal isolation, um, behavioral isolation, different mating rituals, songs and calls, mechanical isolation, your parts don't fit together, and then gamete isolation, the zygote won't fuse, post-zygotic isolating mechanisms, remember hybrid inviability, it doesn't develop, or infertility. Okay, so there's just another way of saying what we have talked about. And in the next video, I'll start talking about the modes of speciation. And if you are one of my students, I will see you in class.